So we thought that uh, we would go beyond talking about technology, qua technology, and talk of the politics of technology. And uh, that's why this session was called Diminishing Democracies. Uh, we have big tech, we have red tech, and we have deep tech. And technology, which was supposed to be the great liberator, it was supposed to be the great enabler of democracy and the democratic impulse. Instead, what we have seen is that big tech is now increasingly playing an interventionist role, a disruptive role, and often a political role in democracies around the world. While red tech is being used by authoritarian regimes, for uh, surveillance, for subjugation, and beyond their borders for subversive activities. And deep tech, of course, is about largely about criminality. So whether it is identity theft or disinformation campaigns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Anne. And uh, how do you see the? Uh, this whole idea of big tech playing a partisan role, and we have seen it very acute, acutely in the last two, three months. When it came to Russia, you know, you had Google, you had Facebook, you had others sort of take sides, and that is not what technology is supposed to be doing. Thank you so much for the question, and, and it's really good to be here, and I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. And I think to the question that you're asking, after Putin's invasion of Ukraine, when we saw certain social media companies say they wanted to address the information imbalance and say that it's particularly important that in the context of the invasion, that both around the world, individuals should be able to assess what has occurred and react in a manner that ensures that it's informed. And I think what's most interesting to me, frankly, and you know, before coming out on the stage, we had a bit of a discussion among the group, and the perspective that there was a sense of resentment about decisions, social me decisions that social media companies made with regard to downranking certain information or saying that in countries like Russia, where there were significant restrictions on what information would be available to Russians to assess the conflict, that it was an imbalance when then the Russian government could use public social media to convey its message more broadly around the world, while domestically its own population didn't have access to all sides of the story. So I think what we've seen in the last few weeks has really been social media companies attempting to address the criticism that they've experienced over the last few years, that the freewheeling open debate and the upranking of information that in some cases was most incendiary has led to an environment where social media is not a place for reasoned discourse. And then in the context of the invasion, and in the context of an environment like this, they needed to act to bring greater information balance. So it certainly, I think, is very much a reaction to the criticisms over the last few years, the greater knowledge about the role of social media in facilitating disinformation and facilitating, I think, a degraded trust in election integrity around the world. And that played out in the environment of Putin's invasion of Ukraine when the social media companies took steps to address that imbalance on their platforms. Mr. Ahmed, uh, technology, as I said, was to be the great liberator, the great enabler of democracies. But uh, we have experienced the uh, politicization of what was supposed to be apolitical technology. The net neutrality is now forgotten. So how, how do countries like Bangladesh respond to this? Um, thank you very much, Kanchan. Including the weaponization of big mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, we, uh, 
we consider our democratic values because uh, what we believe that if uh, our citizens can practice uh, democratic values that can actually create um, a society what we want and we have seen that how these big tech companies are using AI, machine learning, and big data analytics tools to control uh, this economy, and they are influencing, and they have gained the influential power by using uh, technologies. So in Bangladesh, uh, what we considered that we believed in, um, in, in, in democracy, but at the same time, we are trying to establish digital literacy centers that we consider that people should be uh, digital literate so that they can differentiate about the fake news, about their protection of their personal and privacy of data. And that is why we have introduced a law, digital security law under that law. We have set up digital security agency to, to protect our cyber space at the same time we are uh, providing training and awareness programs for our children, for our students, and for the citizens of our country. Our father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Rahman, believed uh, in one ideology that, that is uh, the friendship to all, malice towards none. And also we are following that strategy for our digital policies and laws. We are uh, protecting our our data and our uh, privacy and rights, uh, freedom of speech of our, our citizens. But at the same time, we don't believe in attacking to other countries. And that is why uh, we are planning to draft our data protection law, um, studying GDPR and the laws in Australia or, or Singapore. And we have seen that how Canadian government they are actually implying their laws to manage the social media platforms. So they are making accountable all the social media platforms, right? Uh, like our traditional, our electronic media, how they are following all of our country's national laws. So we have seen that how this big tech, red tech, and deep tech are influencing in our economy and politics. And I want to uh, propose of a regional social media platform like country like uh, Bangladesh, India, we can work together. And definitely, we should create a network like European Union, how they are introducing their general data protection rules. We should have also data protection rules for Southeast Asia or for uh, Asia Pacific countries. Uh, and last of all, I would like to uh, propose uh, in this forum that uh, so far I don't have any information about United Nations. Do they have any council on uh, privacy data or protection of data? I don't think so. They don't have that kind of council. So if United Nations uh, can come with this kind of council to protect citizens' uh, uh, data and privacy policy, that would be uh, really appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Nanjia, this when we look at red tech, it can get quite scary. Mm. So what are your views on this whole idea of deploying technology for setting up a surveillance state, a state that subverts others, subjugates? I think it's important right off the bat to ensure that when people hear the word red tech, it doesn't invoke the idea that it's particular actors versus others. The dichotomies we're operating in today are quite um, polarizing. We've seen even democratic tech being used in a particular context to advance those uh, intentions, be they surveillance, be they discrimination of particular communities. And understanding the political context within which any technology is being deployed or is being procured for use is very important for us to understand whether it turns out to be democratic tech, big, <laughs> big tech in that context, or red tech. Increasingly, with the political environment, and we see this, say, in my, my home region, which is Africa, securitization generally of societies because of terrorism, because of other conflicts that are creating, you know, that kind of uh, securitization policy in, in, le uh, in legislation does then create the demand for the kinds of tech 
that then advance surveillance or the idea of security provision. So um, that then creates the kind of demand that is met by the kinds of supply we've seen. So as long as the issues that are driving insecurities to lead to security laws that then require technologies to surveil people or to control in that sense um, movement or any other um, you know, issue, then we will see more demand for this so-called red tech. And I think it really does go back to what the UN Secretary General calls a trust deficit disorder in society. For as long as that exists, is, isn't any tech that's just going to bypass any intrinsic motivation for its use. Thank you. Mr. Lal, is this the new normal? I mean, the disruption of financial services, of digital services, blocking out entire countries, no rules come into play. Is this going to be the new norm, the new standard, this point on? Right, excellent questions and excellent comments. Um, I think uh, just stepping back a little bit and looking at technology in general and technology as a de democracy enabler, um, I feel um, we have to realize that innovation and R&D and ha has led to development of a lot of technologies and their applications, whether good or bad, have been um, to be regulated, obviously, uh, in different contexts, different geographies. However, I'd like to bring out the point that, you know, um, there is still a lot of good as a result of some of the technology that's been enabled. And uh, it's not a fixed point, so it will evolve. In the next decade, I think, you know, all the issues we're talking about today are going to evolve. There are going to be new buzzwords, if you will, in terms of technology and how the technology has evolved to um, influence, if you will, um, certain geographies. And so it's important to keep in mind we will see faster connectivity over the next decade. And so we have a um, global GDP of 1.2 trillion or approximately there, and that will double in the next decade. And I think um, as that doubles and we have things like faster connectivity, revolutionary technologies, not just evolutionary technologies, there has to be a balance between um, innovation and things that enable democracy and regulation. And, and I think Anne, Anne mentioned it best in, in terms of the balance that will be needed moving forward. Thank you. So we have Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar with us now. He's the Minister for uh, Information Technology <laughs> in India. Uh, I, I thought I, I would... explain why I've come late. <laughs> no, I think we'll just skip that part. No, 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 no. I have to say that I, my program is at 12.50. Oh. So I just want to make that clear. I wasn't late. I was uh, told that The rest 12. of us were early. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the rest of us were early. So I had thought of starting with you. Go ahead. Uh, somebody <laughs> made a very interesting point over here yesterday, someone from the audience that should big tech now think in terms of hiring their own diplomats, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> now, the point he was, or the lady was trying to make, was that have big techs now become independent republics of technology? How do we engage with them on their terms? Because they say their rules override sovereign laws. And you have been quite vocal on this. Can I respond? Yeah, yeah. No, look, I think uh, I think every, everybody who's a big tech, small tech, medium tech, they've, uh, they're innovators and they're entitled to their, um, you know, in the sen sen sense of uh, being change agents, if you want to call it that. But I think uh, to start giving them a status where they believe that they are, in a sense, beyond laws, rules, uh, or any existing jurisprudence is, uh, is to trespass into delusion uh, because at the end of the day, uh, most open societies have elected governments, they have rule of law, and that rule of law applies to uh, everybody, every Indian citizen, every citizen in the, in the jurisdiction that they are operating, and uh, uh, the rules and laws apply. I think the, the, the point here is that for several years and maybe decades, 
a uh, lot of these platforms have uh, have been treated by governments around the world as innovators and and uh, demonstrators of innovation and uh, with innovation there is a tendency for governments to be light touch regulation let's not uh, disturb and disrupt what they're doing and so in the process we've allowed them to be these big uh, forces on the internet that uh, now sometimes uh, seems that it's you know difficult to put back the genie into the bottle but uh, i say this kanjan and i've said this uh, earlier as well uh, that uh, rules and laws apply uh, and uh, they will apply to all uh, platforms and intermediaries regardless of where the jurisdiction is or where the domicile is if they operate in a particular country uh, the rules and laws must apply and if the rules and laws, uh, laws are not uh, adequate enough then we must frame the rules and frame the laws that ensure certain basic principles of accountability and uh, and uh, abiding law are maintained looking at some sort of a global governance model or a structure or i mean are we just leaving it to independent countries no look i think it's a uh, it's a it's a bit of both because i think uh, the laws and rules of every country has to adapt and adopt adapt to the challenges that these uh, these islands on the internet represent uh, these are all very very powerful they are gatekeeping access to the internet they have a tremendous power and influence on what is being the, you know consumed what the narrative and discourse on the internet so there have to be rules and laws for that particular country depending on who the, which country is uh, is is looking at that but i also believe that given the nature of cyberspace given the fact that Uh, this is a, the internet was conceived to be something that spans geographical boundaries there has to be some framework around which open societies and countries that want to cooperate and believe that we must cooperate to create a standard set of let us say operating principles if you want to call it that uh, on the internet and i i have argued uh, for that uh, quite a lot because there is no point in having a uh, good laws and good rules in one jurisdiction when uh, the the let's say the user harm can be committed in in that jurisdiction but the perpetrators in another jurisdiction and then this just feeds into this narrative that the cyberspace is something of a wild lawless wild west which is that people can get away with things uh, even in india as you know that when we argued that the first originator for crime should be detected uh, there is a push back saying no 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 but first originators means trespassing into privacy but then if you have anonymization anonymous use of the of the platform and you are uh, committing user harm and then you argue that you will not be, allow the perpetrator of the user harm to be identified then it almost seems like we are uh, conceding the to the argument that the cyberspace will be a lawless land and that can't be uh, good for anybody not good for india not good for any open society thank you Uh, and uh, in the us you have had several congressional hearings on trying to figure out where where to draw the red line i mean that they cannot act uh, to and it's often said that they have their rules are wild west rules and yet there is also this perception that big technology is today putty in the hands of big powers so how do you reconcile these two apparent contradictions it's a really interesting question you know i I'll, i'll share a story a number of years ago during a heightened um threat stream around terror activities occurring um in europe and in the us really actually around the world um uh, i was working in the intelligence community and we were tracking a particular threat stream at an upcoming world cup event and we were asking the social media companies to be more helpful to us in sharing information they might see that could help us quickly alert on a threat and we took a trip to a silicon valley as a group of government officials to sit down and discuss how to improve public private partnership and it was a difficult discussion there were the discussions around you know encryption free speech on the platform what should be um government's right to lawful requests and in the middle of this discussion we took a break 
and as I walked out to the restroom, I saw the World Cup game on the TV and paused for a moment you know, with worry because we were literally tracking this threat stream but didn't have enough information to feel we could actually prevent anything. And as we walked back into the room, I decided to share that. So I turned to the group and I said, you know, here is the challenge. We're operating with different, to use the minister's words, accountability. As a government official, I'm account we're accountable as a group to try to save lives, to prevent this threat intelligence from becoming an actual incident, hopefully to have a success in the shadows that our citizens never know about, so they just enjoy going to a World Cup game. And to you here, you know, you're looking at free speech on the platform, and will that free speech be impacted by potentially sharing some information? How do we come to more shared values and accountability? Because, you know, in that case, the discussion was about encryption. If encryption was rolled out on that platform, and the government didn't have the ability to rapidly identify potential threat streams, lives could be lost. And I think that at its core is the discussion here. Because in the different society, essentially, social media connects, has tremendous positive power to connect individuals around the world seamlessly from their homes and their offices, to share cultures, to learn about other cultures. But there's also significant risks. Whether it's disinformation, we certainly see it in the context of the, of the COVID pandemic that shook the world in the last couple of years. Whether it's affecting children online and threats to children who may not understand the threats that they may see. Or whether it's disinformation that leads vulnerable populations to not vote or to, uh, to not engage in discourse or to feel persecuted online. And I think the question we can have, and from a U.S. perspective, when President Biden launched the Summit for Democracies, his goal was bringing democracies together. Even among democracies, we have different values when it comes to the balance of security and speech. I think, for example, of Germany and Holocaust denial speech, which is there are rules against that in a way that in the United States there's not, because the history of Germany led it to place a greater value on controlling that speech because of the dangers of what it could bring. So the purpose, at least, of President Biden's launch of the Summit for Democracies was to bring countries together to talk about how we discuss technology and values, how we protect speech online, how we protect media online, how we can both protect privacy and also gain the benefits of technology. We're talking about social media, but also artificial intelligence brings a similar thing, because at the root of social media is that. So to your point, first I want to assure you that in the US, the framework we have for social media is actually a distinct. It's Section 230 is the particular rule that has broad-based protections um, for social media companies, as distinct, I might point, to either television or movies, which, as you know, have ratings. So as we look at that today, in the US as well, we're having a debate around accountability for tech. In some of the categories I provided, protection of children, disinformation, election integrity. And I think there's an opportunity for a conversation around that to arrive at some shared values and shared principles to gain the benefits of global communications without some of the risks we're seeing. And in that way, just to close, I think what we've observed in the last really two, three years has been tech companies taking some greater accountability for that with regard to putting more controls about COVID disinformation, with regard to working more closely around election integrity and foreign disinformation. And frankly, while there are different perspectives on what occurred with the invasion of Ukraine and the decision social media companies made, what they were seeking to do was at least address the imbalance of authoritarian countries like Russia controlling their own citizens' access to information while freely broadcasting disinformation, inaccuracies, and lies. Um, well, for the there, global there is community. the other perspective that why should technology get to decide that question? Uh, Mr. Lal, uh, politics is now embedded in technology. After all, algorithm is politics. And the way it is designed, the way it is crafted, it becomes an instrument of politics. So how do we restore the balance? If we could get quick responses, and then we'll go into question sure. answer. Um, I think uh, along with politics, there are five other friends of politics that are probably part of this um, equation. Uh, I think in, in every country, and um, there are 
six buckets of stakeholders that need to come together to um, address this issue. Polit the political spectrum is one. I think the bureaucratic spectrum is the other uh, to create some of those uh, trust architectures um, that can uh, solve these issues. The third is the industry at large and the industry captains. Um, the fourth, I would say, is academia and think tanks. Um, and, and then finally, media and communications. And of course, all this for the end user. So if you take all these different uh, stakeholders and, and kind of merge them together, that will then de help define some of the solutions that we're looking for. Thank you. Mr. Ahmed, a quick response. Time for a third front, emerging technology. So there is big tech, there's red tech, deep tech, and emerging tech. Countries impacted negatively by big tech or apprehend apprehensive of a negative impact at some point. They come together and come up with their alternative. Yes, it is very much necessary to uh, develop our own capacity like countries like India, Bangladesh. We should have our own technological capacity to, to introduce new technologies, um, new innovations. At the same time, if this big tech or red tech or deep tech influencers are trying to influence our politics or our economy, we should be able to protect our economy our rights of the citizens and also uh, I think we should work in a collaborative and partnership way because we believe this is the time not to compete to each other, this is the time to collaborate to each other and if we work like a, um, a regional entity I think we can be able to protect our uh, people's rights and at the same time we can protect our economy and cyberspace. So what we believe in Bangladesh under the prudent leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina that we are using digital technologies for the benefit of the citizens to develop our economy, but we don't want to allow all this big tech or red tech or deep tech to interfere our own political or financial issues. And that is why uh, we are taking four pillar strategy to secure our cyberspace and to literate our digital uh, netizens like first personal level awareness in the family or also in the educational institutions that is the core um, core responsibility for the government and second is technological development when we are not able to innovate or invent new technologies we should collaborate to each other I uh, visited Delhi IIT yesterday and we are having uh, agreements and different different collaboration between Ministry of Electronics and IT, how we can develop new technologies and emerging technologies so that we can give our citizens a better life. And third is rules, regulations and laws. All these rules, regulations and laws, not only for our country, but also it should be regional and we should have international internet governance. And fourth is international collaboration, what I have mentioned before. So let me conclude by mentioning one of my favorite quotations by great leader Mahatma Gandhi. He said, an eye for an eye end up the whole world blind. So we should be careful about this big tech, red tech, and deep tech influence in our politics and financial activities. So I would like to conclude by mentioning one of my favorite quotations by Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. I quote, if you want to go fast and far, innovate together. Let's work together, innovate together to make the world a better place for our future generations. Nanjira, I will let you have the last word. How, how do we get back to technology as an instrument of global good? And then we go for Q&A. Sure. I think it's a, much of what has been said here. I think we just also have to accommodate the fact that even as we talk about shared values, there are sometimes some assumptions that we're all speaking from the same hymn book. So how accountability looks in one region must be listened to to understand if it is what 
is uh, translated to how the technologies are designed. I think the last, the last couple of years have really laid bare the fact that technologies are not developed in a value neutral space or in a vacuum. And then the actions of the last few weeks have made sure that we know that these are not value neutral actors. If anything, they have really showed their hand in terms of when rubber meets the road, how they're going to act. So it really does make, go back to the whole conversation about global governance and how um, views are sort of crowdsourced to say we are talking about a global commons. That in itself, whether it's emerging tech, alternative from what we already have, or a reform of big tech, will be a big determinant of where we go forward. Thank you. Uh, we'll now open the floor to questions. We'll begin with the Raisina Young Fellows. So can we start with the Raisina Young Fellows, please? Hello, my name is Susan Young. I'm a Chinese-born German journalist and I'm part of the Young Fellow program. Um, while, de while debating polarization in the public sphere, there's a lot of emphasis on the question how to fight misinformation and how to sec secure the right to free speech. And Minister Chan Drasakar, you have addressed this by raising the need for standardized platform rules across borders. However, we rarely discuss how to provide and secure a base of reliable facts upon societies who can not only have an open but also informed discussion. Um, and we all know that if half the voters uh, in democracies believe that Earth is flat, then societies are screwed. So um, there's one quote I, that I think captures the um, problem quite well, is that information travels fast, but truth takes time. And my question to the panel would be how to secure the production of truth in, a, a, in democracies in a post-truth and fast-paced world. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, will take uh, three, four questions and then collectively. Yes, ma'am. Lucy, Lucy Corkin from Rand Merchant Bank in South Africa. Elon Musk, um, <laughs> one of my country's more controversial sons, um, and a self-declared absolutist of free press and free speech, has just effectively assumed control of Twitter. In the context of the comments that were made, especially by Anne and Nanjira, what do you think the political implications of this development are? Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, I'm Aris Nizami. Uh, I, my question is to uh, Honorable State Minister Junaid Ahmed Pollock. So Bangladesh is one of the first countries to put forward the digital Bangladesh agenda, and many countries later followed. You mentioned about a global body that can uh, govern all the like tech companies or looking forward into the you know, community standards of those companies. Do you think that we should also work on the AI biasness that we are being seeing in many countries that all the algorithms are being biased, the data are being biased to a certain extent? So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, maybe one more question from the Raisina Young Fellows, and then we can take them on. Hey, thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. Uh, my name is uh, Vinod, I'm from the United States. Um, how does, um, and this is for Minister uh, Chandra Shaker, uh, how does India, uh, what's India's philosophy in balancing uh, free speech and uh, countering disinformation and uh, hate speech on uh, social media and other platforms? As uh, DNSA uh, Newberger mentioned, this is something we also struggle with uh, or grapple with, I should say, in the United States also, and would really appreciate hearing India's perspective on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one more, and this is the last question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Hello. My name is Marie Schröter from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, and this is a question to the ministers of state from India and Bangladesh. So, thank you. Social media companies have been criticized in the past for not cooperating appropriately with law enforcement agencies on content that's harmful but not illegal. So what's the status quo there at the moment and how would you improve, if necessary, this cooperation? Thank you. So maybe we'll, we have about six minutes to answer. We'll start with Mr. Lal and work this way. Yeah, I, um, I guess I can pick from any of the questions. Uh, uh, a minute each. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would just say, uh, in the previous panel, Minister Jayashankar talked about capability, capability, capability. And I, uh, I just want to reemphasize um, the point that to build that capability, which you rightly alluded to, we would have to come up with um, 
not only what data needs to be protected, who needs to protect it, but also neutral third parties that look at that and figure out uh, the mechanisms and not just the vested parties. And I really appreciated the questions and the thoughtfulness of the questions because they highlight the choices, right? These are not black and white issues. They're fundamentally balancing issues of security and, and speech, of values and accountability. Um, so truly thoughtful questions. And I think the ideas that were proposed here of governments and other key stakeholders in civil society coming together to discuss the issues is really the, the right approach given the degree to which information online and these kinds of choices they come up very much in the question around AI biases, right? Fundamentally, AI is driven by lessons or information learned from data. And when there are different pockets of data collected, the AI results may or may not represent different societies, different socioeconomic societies, different ethnic societies. And then the rules of that AI may be enforced in a manner that again, needs to be reflective of the diversity around the world. So I think the conversations where we debate and discuss these choices that need to be made, and I think some are reflected in regulations that are now being put in place in individual countries, is the best approach to govern this global space in a manner that's consistent with the diverse values that make up that global commons. Thank you. Mr. Ahmed. Yeah, thank you. Um, to all the uh, um, discussions and uh, interesting questions uh, have been asked. So I think I have already mentioned about our proposal to have a council on um, emerging technologies or frontier technologies under United Nations. At the same time, we have seen how uh, steel companies or uh, multinational oil companies, they brought under the national uh, laws uh, in different countries. So this is the time we should actually consider that kind of example, and we should try to push those um, giant, all these big tech companies, to follow the national uh, rules and although also um, the laws. At the same time, for AI, for big data, for robotics, we should have uh, international uh, consensus and also a council under United Nations so that they should all who are doing research and developing new technologies, new products based on AI, robotics, or big data analytics, they should follow um, the global uh, guidelines uh, and we should have the global governance on frontier technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chandrasekhar, I will let you have two minutes to make up for lost time. Okay. Uh, uh, really, the laws and rules of India don't care too much about who owns what. The openness, safety, and trust, and accountability expectations from intermediaries remain uh, intact and don't change depending on who's the owner. And I think Elon has already issued a statement about him complying with the laws of each, each country. So I think that's where that will go. On, there are three questions that were uh, more or less on the same, uh, same broad uh, category truth versus lies, free speech versus hate speech, and uh, how do you get social media to cooperate? And I think really there is a need for a conversation, maybe global, maybe uh, we are having it anyway in India, which is that we need to broaden the, the scope of uh, uh, the, the, the response from the social media or indeed any digital platform to go beyond just criminality. And we have to create a consensus around what user harm is. And, uh, and user harm will therefore require these platforms to conduct more due, due diligence or, and or take ownership, uh, either as a platform or as a user. Uh, 230 in the US, Section 79 in India gives safe harbor to these platforms. But the safe harbor has a corollary reciprocal impact that needs to be read out, I think, uh, in, in any new legislation or new protocol, which is that that safe harbor is only as long as you conduct the due diligence and you ensure there is no user harm or criminality, or you permit the investigation of user harm and criminality or, or prosecution of the same. Algorithmic bias exists. That's just a fact. Uh, the, the coders who code the algorithms have their own 
views about life. Uh, if you take a look at uh, the big tech platforms and uh, how employees contribute to which political party, there are many such very sharp uh, uh, diverse, uh, you know, diversities in their views. And therefore, we need to create a structure of algorithmic accountability and transparency around uh, and trust around the algorithms that these platforms use. And that is just something that we must uh, move towards working uh, and uh, making sure that it happens. Thank you. And time's up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for sharing you your sure. views. And thank you, audience, for being here. जल्द से जल्द वन ट्रिलियन डॉलर का क्लाइमेट फाइनेंस उपलब्ध कराएं। Richest countries। कालह पच्चती बुदानी, कालह समहरते प्रजा, कालह सुपदेशु जागरती, कालो ही दुर्दिक्रमा।